Hey everybody, I'm Bart Massey. I want to talk today about how to get the Rust uh, environment set up and running on a new machine. So we're going to be using Rust up to do that and we're going to uh, then go ahead and build and run a small program just to show how all this stuff works. That's the plan for today. So let's go ahead and get started with that. First we're going to um, go to rustup.rs which is where the um, installation stuff lives. There's a lot of ways you can install. I'm installing on one of our Linux laboratory boxes here at Portland State University and they actually have a distro version of Rust that I might be able to install but honestly you're usually better off just using Rust up. It gives you control over your environment, gives you your own local setup which is what you really want. So let's copy this URL and then paste it into this window and this is almost always a bad idea. You should almost never just run a shell script without reading it first to install something but I can sort of assure you that this one is going to be okay. You can take my word for it or you can run the shell script into a file and read it first which is probably the smart people way but we won't be doing the smart people way today. We're going to do it like this. So uh, I want to actually customize the installation for a couple of reasons. So I'm going to pick option two here. I definitely want the x86-64 unknown Linux GNU stuff. That's what we've got on this box. I definitely want the stable tool chain. I'm actually going to pick the minimal profile for reasons I'll talk about in a bit. And I'm going to not modify the path variable because my path variables are a little weird. If you want to modify your path variable that's fantastic but if you're going to do that um, if you're not going to do that then the modified path variable thing is completely fine so let's do this let's take the default host triple take the default tool chain let's choose minimal as our profile let's not modify the path variable and then let us proceed with the installation and on a machine with any decent network connection, this is actually pretty quick. The reason I chose the minimal profile instead of the default profile is that um, the default profile by default installs the Rust documentation, which is a really, really good idea, but also takes forever and a week on these machines because of a weird anomaly in their combination of NFS and network stuff that I've never really diagnosed. So now we actually have the minimum set of Rust already installed. The only thing we need to do is exactly what it says on the screen. We need our cargo bin directory uh, installed into our environment. So I'm going to edit my big terrible mess of environment variables. Like I say, it will just write this in for you, but it won't do it quite the way I want it. So I'm going to add home.cargo slash bin to my path and then I'm going to source my shn and now if I say which rust c look at that I've got a rust compiler now I'm super excited so we're now going to add some things that you're also going to want so I'm going to say rust up component add um, Rust docs, and this is probably going to need to run in the background, but I will do it eventually. I'm going to first add a couple of tools that you're really, really going to want. I'm going to add Rust format, which is the tool for formatting Rust according to the standard format. I'm going to add Clippy, which is an absolutely fantastic tool for linting your code and giving you advice about what to do. And finally, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do earlier, um, which is to start to add the um, documentation. And like I say, the problem with this one is that it's extraordinarily slow. Typically, it's saying 7 seconds, 11 seconds, but now it's realizing that it's downloading insanely slowly. Like I say, this seems to be some weird interaction between things. And so what I'm going to actually do is 
run this in the background and go on with my day. And by the time we get this stuff done, um, we should be able to, oh, that's interesting. It's really not supposed to be able to do that, but okay, I, I'm not quite sure what happened there. So we now have, um, oh, I see, it's because I got the things, the arguments backwards. Oh, well, it looks like it's working fine. Um, it's gonna be fine, it'll finish it here in a bit. So in the meantime, we're gonna actually create our first little Rust program, and we'll just do it right here. I'm gonna say cargo new dash dash bin um, demo. And so this is cargo. Cargo is the standard Rust package manager, and it's almost always a good idea, rather than trying to use the Rust compiler directly, to actually use cargo to manage your Rust projects. Dash dash bin here means that I want an executable program, not a library. Rust likes to build libraries, but that isn't what we're doing today. And demo is just gonna be the name of my library. And when that finishes, which there it does, this is a pretty slow machine. I now have a thing called demo. And you'll notice I have two things. I have um, cargo.toml which is a configuration file for the build. And I have this source directory and in the source directory is main.rs, which is a skeleton program that we can fill out into our Rust program. Now, the third thing I have, which is super secret, is I have a .git directory that's automatically created by Cargo by default. And so that's nice. And we will definitely be maintaining our source code with Git. So let's look at the cargo.2ml and see if what's in it, Tommel, however you pronounce it. And it looks like, wow, this Max doesn't have its menu bar out of the way. Oh, well, I can live with it. Um, it looks like, you can see here that this is the author address, a version number, the name, editions. It describes where to get more keys. We don't actually need any more keys or any dependencies today. So we're just gonna wipe that out. And then let's look at source slash main.rs. And you'll notice that it helpfully supplied us with a main.rs, which prints hello world. So let's actually build and run that. Cargo build. And it's gonna sit there and compile our little Rust program. And when it's compiled, I can say cargo run. And there you are, you've got a running Hello World app. Now, it also will have created a target directory. All the build products are actually in this target directory. And you'll notice I've got target debug. We have built with debugging turned on, which makes debugging possible, but also makes your program runs substantially slower. If I really want to um, get a good fast build, like it matters in this case, I can say cargo build dash dash release, and that would build it in release mode. That won't get rid of my debugging code, but it will also build release code. I can also um, use cargo run with the release flag, and it will make sure it's built up to date before running it. Um, so you don't have to do the build as a separate step. If I just want to make sure my code's okay, I can do cargo check, which doesn't actually build anything, but much more quickly checks to make sure that my program would compile if I were to compile it. So those are useful commands to have here. Let's make our program do something more interesting than printing hello world. Uh, oh, wait. So two other tools um, that you really need to know about. Because we installed Rust format earlier, we now have cargo format, which is a fantastic way to, oh, and good, our docs are installed now, which, is a, which takes all the source code in our project and reformats it to meet current sort of standard Rust standards. Let's see if anything any interesting happened there, not so much. If you're doing, if you've written anything substantial, I strongly suggest checking in to Git before you reformat it so that if you don't like the formatting changes it's made, you at least, you know, 
can think about what to do about that. But honestly, you should just take Rust formats formatting until you get pretty good at the language because it's going to be better than what you could do and it's going to be what everybody expects to see. Um, the other tool that's pretty cool is Cargo Clippy, which again doesn't print anything here because our program's too boring. Clippy actually walked over our source code looking for things it could suggest about how to make the program better. So those are really, really powerful tools. Um, if I say cargo doc dash dash open, I believe it is, I will get myself a lovely um, copy of the documentation opened in some browser here. Although I'm not finding it. Oh no, that documents my project. There's actually nothing interesting in there and we'll talk about Rust doc in some future thing. All right, let's make this program actually do a thing. Um, that sounds good. Oh, here we go. Here's cargo doc. Um, I don't want to refresh Firefox, go away. Um, oh, I see, this is running the browser remotely from my machine across the network. That's probably a bad idea. Got it, okay. So, um, let's, uh, yeah, quit this Firefox, it's not helping. Let's go ahead and make this program do something interesting. I decided today's exercise is going to be to make this thing actually create a, uh, take a list of numbers from the command line and print their, uh, some it's going to be the most boring program anyone ever wrote but at least will show doing something so to do that we're going to have to you'll notice here that this looks a lot like a c function it's got curly braces around the body uh, it doesn't take any arguments it turns out rest programs don't do their arguments that way but it's, it also has this declaration fun the type declaration syntax is a little different so what we're going to do is we're going to first read a bunch of stuff from the command line. And this gets gross really super fast. Why are we not in Rust mode? Oh, I don't have Rust mode installed for my Emacs. Ah, uh, that's interesting. All right. We aren't going to be able to live without that. So, um... How am I going to do this? Probably the easiest way is to get my local copy of Firefox, um, Rust, Emacs mode. How do I install this? Here's Rust mode, which is what I normally use. It's super boring. Um, installation. Uh, manual insta installation. Okay. This is what I'm gonna do because my setup's pretty weird and I don't even wanna think about Melpa. So let's edit my Emacs files. Now there's a billion good IDEs for Rust and you may choose to use one of them. But for me, I'm just going to, I don't have this already installed somewhere, do I? I do not, all right. So my, uh, Rust stuff is a little fancy. Uh, I mean, my Emacs stuff is a little fancy here. I prefer to just use straight Emacs because I'm old and sad, but your mileage may vary on this one. Let's try this. This can go like that. Rust mode. Um, and that's going to be tilde Etsy Emacs slash Rust mode. And then we're going to have to grab a copy of Rust mode from somewhere. So, where am I going to get that? I need to grab it from, where's the source code here? Rustmode.el. Okay, I guess that's the whole story is I just need that. So let's grab a copy of that. Um, 
click on the raw tag is probably the easiest. Control A, Control C. Make sure it's not there already. It's not. And let's get back into it now. should be it that should be all I need to do so let's let, let's edit our thing again nope we're still in rust mode oh there we are so the auto load hook didn't work I'll fix that later so now you can sort of edit things without going completely insane what we're gonna do first is get our arguments um, do we want arguments here? I guess we don't really need arguments at this point. What we need is to read a file. And to do that, we're gonna have to use stuff from the standard library in particular. Um, uh, we need the buff read trait. Okay, if you notice a little glitch there, that was me getting myself back together. We've typed a little bit of code here, and I want to actually show you that code that we've just typed. So I needed to do a bunch of things to be able to read lines out of standard input. I need to be able to get the buff read trait in scope, don't ask. I needed to get a file descriptor for standard in, unlike in C, that comes out of a file. I need to make a buff reader so that I can read a line at a time out, and then I need to call that buff reader's lines methods. You'll notice that this is a shadowing thing. I've got standard in here. I'm gonna call this standard in. I'm gonna use that standard in over here, and then I'm gonna use this standard in over here. This is pretty standard Rust stuff, and we're pretty happy with that. That's a big difference than other languages where that's considered bad style, but for us it's considered good style. You'll notice our for loop here is sort of a different style than the C style. I'm actually asking for the line to be read from an iterator. So this thing actually returns successive lines each time through the loop. And there's this interesting bit of code. This piece of code actually um, will cause the program to crash if there's an error reading the line. Uh, Rust error handling, again, is a little different than C error handling, and in particular, you can't just ignore errors like you can in C. You actually have to check. So this program will panic if I get to that. So finally, then, we'll print the line just like we did before. Let's run cargo check. And it says, yeah, your program's fine. Um, and then let's... Um, get out and run cargo run. So now effectively what we've built is cat. We've got a nice cat implementation sitting here somewhere. So let's take a look at that running. We'll just use etc group. I always use that for these things. So now it actually has to compile it. So we just checked it before and hey, there's all our lines of text. Okay, that's fantastic. We're halfway there and this is actually the hard half. So now all we got to do is instead of uh, just printing the lines, we want to make them into a sum. So there's a lot of ways we could do this, including some really clever ones. I don't feel like being clever today, so let's just do this in a sort of a C-ish style, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, and now the only trick is how do I take my line, which is supposed to be a number, and uh, make it into a number instead of a string. So right now this thing's a string. One of the things I should have said is that Rust has a type checker that runs 
even though your things don't appear to have types, it infers a type for everything here. So it knows this is a standard IO file. It knows this is a standard IO buff reader. This, it knows that um, this is an in integer number of some kind. If it was a floating point number, there would be a dot here. It hasn't figured out what kind yet because it hasn't had to care. My point is this, if I say sum plus equals line, I'm going to have a bad time because now I'm taking a string, which is what line is after unwrapping it. Here, it's interesting. This line is actually a either a string or an error of some kind. And what unwrap does is actually crashes the program if it's an error. And if it's not an error, it turns it, it just gets, gets the string out and uh, that's what line is here. So at this point, line's a string. I can actually um, give it a type explicitly if I want. But let's let's see what happens when we try to compile this program. Because what we really want to do is this, right? So let's actually have it happen. Um, so now we'll add each line to the sum, and we'll print the sum. It'll be exciting. Oh, can't assign a string to an integer. Well, it's hard to argue with that. So before we do this, we're going to have to uh, somehow convert this. And the standard way to do this is um, with parse. Um, but parse is the thing that takes a string and turns it into a number, and that certainly can fail. So again, I have to take into account that it might be an error. I'm gonna use something actually called expect, and I think I'll go back and make this use expect to IO error. And here, um, expect will um, say unreadable. And one of the things I should say at this point is obviously this isn't production grade code. You don't want your program to just crash whenever it runs into something that's not a number. But for now, we're just going to go there. We'll, we'll worry about it in some future occasion. And now let's see what kind of complaint we get. Oh, oh, well, first of all, this, let's try again. Oh, type annotations. It's like, okay, fine. You want to parse this line as something. It turns out there's parse implementations from string that take strings to all kinds of things. Who knows what thing? Let's use a um, i64, a 64-bit unsigned number. And so by adding this static type right here, parse the, the compiler figures out that parse must return either an error or one of those, a 64-bit signed integer. And now, having figured that out, it figured out that val is a 64-bit signed integer, so sum has to be a 64-bit signed integer, because the operators don't work if the types are different. And so up here, I could have said this. Um, it turns out I also could have said this. But I don't need to say either of those things, because type inference will figure out what we want. So this, I think, should actually uh, compile. Yep. Uh, and if I say cargo run less than Etsy group like I did before, it's like, no, panicked at unreadable number, invalid digit. And of course, because Etsy group isn't a file of numbers. So let's look at Etsy group a little bit and we'll pull out some numbers from it. It looks like the UID is in field three, uh, minus F colon print um, dollar one, two, three. Hey, there we go. There's a nice list of numbers to sign up. Okay, now let's try cargo run less than slash temp slash list. And look at that. The sum of the UIDs is um, apparently 73083. Cool. We've written a Rust program. And we've written a Rust program that does something very slightly non-trivial. So let's go ahead and commit our work. 
you'll notice that Cargo sets up a git ignore for you that tries to keep the worst of the glop out of your thing. Let's um, let's do git add then, and git commit minus m rust programming demo. And now we've got a nice thing. We can we can hack this up now. However, we feel like messing with it. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to say cargo format git diff it says oh your indentation was fouled up for some reason i have no idea why and so it's fixed that for me this is the kind of thing that cargo format's good at so git commit minus am took rust format changes i don't know how my indentation got so messed up but it did um I'm going to then go ahead and say cargo Clippy. Clippy seems perfectly happy with my work, but I always want to check. So now I'm ready to continue to hack on this thing if there were things to do. Is there anything else I want to do to this program right now? I don't think there is. I kind of feel like this is good. Uh, Oh, right, there is one more thing. So the other, two more things. So two more things that you're gonna wanna do before you're done. Um, for a binary program, you don't really need Rust doc documentation, but it's still a good idea to go ahead and put comments in and stuff. I'll fix that later. And the other thing you might choose to do is to actually make a test, but we don't really have anything very valid to test. Let's, fancy this program up a little bit so that it actually uh, sums lines in some more sensible way. Ah, this is going to be hard to test. So let's break this into two pieces. So uh, We're gonna now have an, take some collection of I-64s. This notation's a big mess, but what it basically says is, pass me an, the address of some uh, collection of I-64s, some sequence of I-64s. Obviously gonna return an I-64 result. And what we're gonna say is for V in vowels, um, which is very convenient, dot iter uh, and we're going to say ampersand so what, what that's going to do is get v to be each value in turn let's get our sum variable up into here so this is now going to become part of this and um, let's go ahead and say sum plus equals v and then at the end, we could say return sum, but it turns out that Rust really likes you instead to just say sum. By the way, you may notice that I've been fully bracketing everything. That's actually required by the Rust programming language. So now we got a function um, sum. We also have a variable named sum, but again, it's not gonna hurt anything, so I'm not gonna change it. Let's put a comment on this function. Let's just use Rust doc style just for grins. Um, return the sum of the indicated values, um, given values. Um, this is, there's a built-in function for this, of course, but I'm not going to use it today. Instead, I'm going to do it this way, just for grins. And so now I really want to write a test here. So let's write some simple test function fun test sum assert equals six sum that should be good now there's a lot going on in this simple test function so let's talk about it the phrase test here um 
let's actually not do this. Let's assert that this sum is, um, there we go. We want some negative numbers as well. This function is actually, um, the way tests work in Rust is that if you put pound sign test, then Cargo knows that Rust, the Rust compiler knows and Cargo knows that this function isn't part of a standard Rust program. It's only being used when the com program is compiled for testing. And when the program is compiled for testing, any test functions in there are run and the test is considered to have passed if the function doesn't panic. So what would make it panic? Well, this assert equals thing down here actually um, will cause the program to panic if the assertion fails. And the assertion in this case is that minus four is equal to this sum. What's this glop? Well, this says make an anonymous sequence in memory of values and pass its address to uh, sum to get this to get the sum of it. And so you can see the differences between C syntax and Rust syntax here. The arrow here means uh, is the return type instead of C's weird thing and putting it on the front. I need the fun keyword and I need, um, and this here says, well, I take the address of a sequence of values. This says, well, okay, here's the address of a sequence of values. Now, what we need to do though, is we need to, in the actual main program, um, we were parsing here, but what we really need to do is make a collection of values. And we're gonna do that using Rust's vector stuff. Um, let you vals equals vec colon colon new. A vector is a Rust built-in type that is a sequence of values, like an array, but it can be grown. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. And we're now going to push um, our, each value onto this thing. And then down here, we're going to call sum of the address of our collection we've built. And we'll be good. Um, push is interesting because push actually tacks a new element. This vector starts out empty right here. Vowels doesn't have anything in it. And each time a new element is tacked onto the end, which is fine. Notice the mute here. What mute means is I'm gonna be changing this, so let me change it. If I leave this mute off, what actually happens here? Let's see if this whole thing, how many compilers I get. Oh, it says, you know, you can't really, um, you can't really do that. It says, well, you know, right here where you try to push, uh, you can't do that because you didn't say that this thing was allowed to be mutated. So now let's mark it so we can mutate it. And hey, there we are. So now we've modified our program so that it actually calls a function. That's fantastic. And now we've got a function that we wrote ourselves. And better yet, um, we have a test that should test it. Well, how do I do the testing? I simply say cargo test says, oh, I found one test and it didn't panic, which means that this sum is exactly what it's supposed to be. Now that's terrible. That's not a great test of anything, right? But it's a, better than no testing. And it gives us some confidence that we're computing the sum correctly. And it's for any non-trivial function, you should probably end up with some unit tests like this. I can you know, add more assertions to this, any one of which panicking would have caused it to fail. Um, This was the test I almost wrote in the first place. Let's test it now. And sure enough, all our tests pass. So now we're in good shape. Uh, let's run Clippy over this and see if it has any complaints. It does not. Let's uh, get out of this and run, and get out of the old version and run cargo format to see if it does anything. And it looks pretty much like what we left. So cargo format doesn't seem to have cared too much about what we do. So this is a pretty good program. Let's run it and see if it gives the same answer. 
So it has to recompile the program because so far we've just been checking and testing it. We haven't built it. And there we are. We now know that some of the UID is in our Etsy group on our box. So there you are. And that, folks, is how you build a perfectly good run Rust program. Let's get commit minus am uh, split out some and added tests. Uh, and tests. There we go. And now our perfectly good Rust program is actually ready for people to go out and use. If I run cargo run again, you'll notice it doesn't build it anymore because it doesn't need to. If I want this to be faster for some reason, there we go. Um, and that is Rust in action. Uh, these programs run quite fast. Notice that I can also just do target slash release slash demo. Um, and it will do the same thing. I don't have to use Cargo Run, but it's convenient to use Cargo Run because it will build it for you if it needs to. And it knows where the binary has been stashed. That's what I got for you. I hope it was useful, and I hope it will inspire you to go out and start writing your own Rust programs. <laughs>